For a few years in the late 1960s, I was a teenager growing up on the farm at Codrington and attending East Northumberland Secondary School in Brighton. Like most teenagers in the area, I knew very well that the place you needed to be on Saturday nights in the summer was Presqu'Isle Pavilion. There was always lots of loud rock music, friends from school, and a great snack bar. It was the place to go to have some fun and to see and be seen. However, this ideal situation would not last. Soon the teenagers moved on to the next phase of life and the venerable old Presqu'Isle Pavilion joined the equally famous Opera House and Town Hall in Brighton at the Wreckers Ball. The early 1970s would see the end of these once popular venues. This video will tell the story of the dance halls that served the Brighton community during the period from the 1880s to the 1960s. Over the years, many different venues would come and go, and we will identify all of them, but we will concentrate on the two most iconic places, namely Presqu'Isle Pavilion and the Opera House in the Old Town Hall. So, pull up a chair, get your toe tapping, and indulge yourself with Dance Hall Days. During the 1880s, the people of Brighton Village and Brighton Township experienced the benefits of all the wrenching change that had taken place the previous three decades. Brighton Township was created in 1852. Then the village separated in 1859. The Grand Trunk Railway was built along the lakeshore during the 1850s, at the same time as the new Brighton and Seymour Gravel Road was built to the north. The rural communities changed as farmers switched from wheat to beef and dairy farming. Many folks moved into town, expanding the prosperous middle class of professionals, merchants, and tradesmen. There was an explosion of entertainment across the country. Traveling circuses drew excited crowds and theater troops came to town to present the classics in comedy and drama. Camping grew in popularity and the railway and the better roads allowed folks to travel greater distances and experience the good things in life. In Brighton, it was high time for a serious entertainment venue. Of course, there were plays, dances, and concerts held in Brighton before the town hall was built in 1885. We see an example in the collection of Proctor House Museum in a program for Miss Cook's Concert to be held Friday evening, November 9th, 1883. The program shows two parts with a list of performers for each. There are several vocalists, instrumental trios, and duets, and a reading by Mr. Gilchrist. The location of the concert is not shown, but we can expect an enjoyable evening was had by all. At this time, the village of Brighton was lacking in two important areas. First, there was no opera house. Every town needed a large hall that was designed to support live theater, musical performance, and dancing. In order to play the role effectively, the space must present a dignified and artistic countenance, which encouraged the performers to greater heights of virtuosity and left the audience in awe of the sights and sounds of a really good night out. A slightly more mundane, but no less important problem was the lack of a proper town hall. All around the country, towns were putting up large, elaborate brick buildings, which were designed to impress both locals and visitors. A majestic town hall was a clear demonstration of the prosperity of the village and the surrounding region. Many of the movers and shakers in Brighton Village believed that they must have a proper town hall, and they set about the task. In 1884, Brighton Village Council purchased two town lots from John Edward Proctor for $925 for the building of a new town hall. The building would face south onto Main Street, occupying a large part of the eastern side of today's Memorial Park. The building would be large with two stories, anchored by a tall tower at the front. The design was the same as the Presbyterian Church, which had been built just to the west on Main Street. The lower floor would accommodate council chambers, township offices, and meeting rooms, as well as a small jail. The north end would be made into a fire hall, but it was the tall upper floor with the lovely stained glass windows that would give this structure its character. This was the Opera House. The majority of the upper floor was occupied by one large space, 
high-ceilinged and illuminated by tall arched stained glass windows. At the north end was the elaborate stage flanked by doors leading from the first floor. There's only one picture of the interior of the opera house that shows the purpose-built nature of the design and the artistry of the period. Art on both sides and simulated columns lead the eye to the portrait of Sir Johnny MacDonald above the stage. Looking further, we can see back into the stage area where the actors and stagehands would move the props around as each scene required. This was designed for theater, and it would have been considered an elegant and very serviceable venue in its day. And look at the chairs for the audience. A number of these chairs survive in the community today. During our Brighton History Week presentation of Dance Hall Days in 2015, the Lawn Bowling Club loaned us a few of these chairs, which had been painted yellow. We used them to select the recipients of door prizes at our event. We also featured another one of the chairs on stage, this one in pristine condition and provided courtesy of Doug Cheer. There is one other image of the interior of the Opera House which demonstrates its function. It shows a large group of local residents dressed for performance and posing for posterity. This event was the celebration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, representing 60 years on the throne. All across the United Kingdom and its colonies worldwide, events like this joyously pay tribute to the revered Queen and to the power and purpose of the British Empire. While today Canada remains a committed member of the Commonwealth, we can only attempt to imagine the degree of feeling that filled the hearts of Canadians more than a century ago. These events represented important cultural practices meant to strengthen connections between the colonies and the Crown. The Opera House was known as the place where we paid tribute to the Crown. Of course, one of the main reasons to have the Opera House was to draw in traveling dramatic companies. These were professional actors and performers organized into companies that traveled from town to town, staying for a week in each place and presenting one or two performances a day for the local audiences. People in this area flocked to these performances, especially now that Brighton had an excellent venue. Newspaper advertisements gave notice of the coming events and posters went up on store windows and tavern walls, exhorting the locals to come to the Opera House to see Joshua Whitcomb or my partner, just two of the many popular plays of the time. One company that played Brighton's Opera House routinely in the late 1880s and into the 1890s was Robert H. Baird's Dramatic Company, out of Hamilton. Baird's played a constant series of events across Ontario, Quebec, and New York State. It had a large cast and supporting crew, which would take up most of the local hotel rooms for a week when it came to a small town like Brighton. The price of admission was accessible for most folks, called People's Popular Prices. And it was not unusual for all the chairs to be taken in the opera house, with some patrons standing at the back. It was a popular ticket. In fact, the R.H. Baird Dramatic Company had a direct connection to Brighton. If we look more closely at the cast for Joshua Whitcomb, we will see that the policeman was played by C. Cheer. In the case of my partner, we see that Mr. Brandon was played by Charles Cheer. This was Samuel Charles Cheer, who went by the common name of Sam, but his stage name was Charles. Sam Cheer had been born in Brighton in 1863, the son of Henry Cheer and Lucinda Davidson. He was in his 20s during the late 1880s and early 1890s when the Baird Company was most active. As we can see, he was a handsome young fellow who wore clothes very easily. Sam Cheer's connection to the Baird Dramatic Company was even closer after he married Alice Towersy of Hamilton in 1890. Alice was the younger sister of Eliza, who had married Robert Baird a decade earlier. In fact, Sam Cheer became the brother-in-law of Robert H. Baird, the leader of the dramatic company. That probably did not hurt his opportunities for acting parts with the company. Sam and Alice were truly a handsome couple, as we can see by these promotional photos, with Sam dressed for his role as Cockles and Rip Van Winkle, and Alice decked out in an elegant gown. As children began to arrive for Sam and Alice in the 1890s, they settled permanently in Brighton, 
and their talents in theater and music would benefit the community for decades to come, including the contribution of their children, Morris, Ralph, and Ruby. The Opera House was their second home as they grew up in a very theatrical family. New Year's Eve parties were highlights in the social calendar in Brighton, and the entertainment at the Opera House very often included the Citizens Band, which was very active at this time. The playbill for one such event says, Opera House Brighton. The Citizens Band present a grand comedy bill under the direction of Mr. Will Bingham, assisted by 30 of the best local talent. Part two is College Chums, and the cast list shows Mr. Charles Cheer in the role of Deacon Tubbs, and the pianist is Mrs. Finley Snellgrove. No doubt all the chairs were taken in the Opera House for this event. <laughs> 